Um, sea turtles. We would like to, no, just kidding. Uh, we have, uh, I think, in, uh, agreed last time that we'll continue our session from last time, but it's, as always, the topic seems to be broadening a little bit into uh, not only um, what are the, the commonalities, differences, the, the reasons for all the different forms of Christianity, principally Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, but then what implications does that have more broadly for our beliefs in Christianity at all? Uh, and I, I think the, an underlying question that I don't know that was asked explicitly last time or any of the previous times is this. Or if, you, if you're not asking this question, maybe you should. Um, if there are so many different forms of the truth out there and they seem so different, how do we have any expectation that what we believe is true? So, I mean, it's kind of easy to say if you just grow up in the one stovepipe of this is what I've heard, this is what I've known, this is, uh, this is a feels right to me. And then you meet somebody else in different clothes, different hat, different liturgy, maybe some different doctrines, et cetera, and that person is just as convinced as you are. I mean, it, ultimately, this is the Mormon problem, right? This is the Jehovah's Witness problem. Is there seem to be very nice people who seem just as so sincerely convinced of their opinions as you are of your opinions, and many of them, I think you can like almost objectively look at and be like, that guy's a better guy than I am, you know? Uh, he, why, how is it that they are left outside the truth and yet you're left inside the truth? And is the only way <coughs> that you can, can resolve this to go to some fatalistic, well, God just picks who he wants and those guys are just as nice or nicer than you are, but he, he chose you and he didn't choose them. You know, that, that's an approach. Uh, there are others. And so I thought that if we haven't gotten to that, even in the course of um, doing this, or rather, if we don't get to that naturally, I would like to artificially inject that question, because to me, it's a key fundamental question that we need to be asking. Um, so we will address that later if, uh, if we don't address it along the way. But let me open it back up to the floor, because we had some questions that, as always, we get into the most heated and best parts of the discussion in exactly 1020 when we're supposed to be shutting everything down. So points, questions, um, diatribes, soapboxes, anything anybody wants to hit from last time? Would a, uh, by way of reminder, would reminder be helpful? <laughs> Where we were, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so we're covering from, I'm not sick anymore, but um, recovering from some old stuff. Uh, I'm not even sure where I kept the rest of the notes. Well, basically, um, let me say where we ended last time. This toddler scribbling was meant to represent um, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant spheres in, out there. And what uh, the, my um, hypothesis last time was, you want to shoot to be in the colored in area in the middle. And what do I mean by that? Out here, uh, I had said these were Catholics who go by the name of Catholic. But if you, if you kind of look at their lives, you're like, yeah, they may call themselves Catholics, but you'd be hard pressed to, to say that uh, you want that guy to be, or gal to be a, a um, representative of their faith. Inside this portion here are ones that are living like you would expect a Catholic to live. Uh, and of course the same is true of the Orthodox, the, the Protestant, et cetera. Inside this core right here are people who, and I kind of brought up the Mother Teresa side. These are people whom, um, I know there are, there are even people, I understand it, think of Mother Teresa as not a very good person. Uh, and for all I know, that's the case. But what I will say is, it seems like that's a person who's willing to, to walk the walk to such a degree that people of the other flavors, the other um, portions of Christianity, look at that person and say, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not 100% sure exactly all the Christian ought to be, but it, that looks a lot more like it than I do. So you want to be, uh, ideally, the person that all three faiths can look to and say, that's what I'm after. That's what I want to be. Why is it, I should, I, if I could color it in white, I would have, uh, just symbol, symbolically, but is that a word? Uh, for symbol, symbolic reasons. That should be where Jesus lives. You know, all three of these religions turn around and say, we disagree on these other things, but what we do agree on, if you ask Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant uh, mainline uh, sections, you will hear the same thing about who Jesus is and what his role is. 
uh, in, in general. This is why I consider all of these, uh, everybody, um, not, uh, a lot of people, most people consider all of these to be Orthodox Christian faiths. Even these faiths themselves do not turn, they used to, but they don't any, anymore turn around and say, the Catholics don't look at the Orthodox and say, those guys are outside of salvation. The Protestants don't look at the Catholics and say, those guys are outside of salvation. Caterus Paribus, that's, that's just the way all three of them are considered to be mainline Christianity. But that is kind of where you want to be. And I brought this up because it's super easy to, and desirable sometimes, to pick the other side to try to show where they're wrong. And what I would tell you is this, for those of us, and I say us because this includes me, who desire to do that, you know, I'd, look, let me show you where you're wrong, and maybe it'll help you out. Why? Because I'm good-hearted, and I just want to help you. I want to help you know where you're wrong. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, unsolicited advice, in case you don't know, uh, giving you some unsolicited advice is never a good way to give advice. Nobody wants unlis- unsolicited advice. If, <coughs> if you are trying to help people of other faiths, and you're focusing on this area right here, which is where 99% of the focus happens. You're, you're picking doctrines, people, and practices that are outside of the core of what it really takes to be a part of that religion. That's not helpful. Picking, so to speak, and having your discussion at this level is fine, but you know you're right if you can criticize. You want to criticize Catholicism? Criticize what Mother Teresa does and believes. In a, loving, in a way that also leaves you in that center shape. If you can pull that off, now you've got a good right and reason to be engaging with somebody else. I would suggest to you that outside of that, to be uh, critical of other faiths is more an exercise in making ourselves feel good than it is about discovering the truth or being useful to the other side. Okay, that was, a, that was my hypothesis. Maybe that spurs some comment. Yes. I'm curious if we ought to attempt to reunite ourselves into one common thing, or if we just, you know, don't even try that, just try to explain like this is how it works. Yes. Um, and so, you know, uh, we did talk a tad about that last time, but one thing I had pointed out, I'll depict a little more uh, in, in drawing fashion. This was, uh, you know, Adam and we'll say Seth. And we go to, uh, we'll just skip ahead to Noah. And from Noah, we'll skip ahead to Abraham. And from Abraham, you, you see the, the tribes, etc. until you get, you know, um, we'll say um, <coughs> uh, J- Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, um, etc. And then when you get to Moses, you know, Abraham was considered the first Jew. Interestingly, do you know, um, in this line here, Who's considered the first Muslim in Islam? Oh, Abraham. Abraham's considered the first Muslim in Islam as well. Uh, I find that an interesting point. Uh, by some, by, you know, by, in Islam, in, by some sections of Islam, by maybe a majority. Um, from Moses, then, you basically have what we consider to be, uh, technically, you get three major branches out of here. Uh, we, we tend to forget that and to focus on it, but basically Israel went one way, and Judah went another, and the Samaritans are, this is why in the New Testament you hear about the Jews reviling the Samaritans. The Samaritans are worse than Gentiles because they have violated the commandment of God and they've interbred with the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and all the otherites. Uh, And so these guys are worse. They're traitors uh, to the Jew. But in reality, um, you know, let's ignore that for a second and basically just say, here's where the religion uh, was is Jewish, and this is Judaism, and rabbinical Judaism starts to emerge at about the same time that Christianity st- uh, starts to emerge. Don't forget, Christians, that Christianity is simply Judaism with the Messiah believed to have arrived in 30-ish A.D., right? So there's... Uh, it, if you are trying to say, to whom do you hearken as a Christian? What should you look like as a Christian? To the, to the, I, I'm focusing initially on this to get to your question, because you said, as a Gentile. And that's a great way to put it. The, the Jews are going to turn around and look at the, these Christians and be like, you want to know how, how we know you're not right? There's like 18,000 flavors of you guys, and none of it 
looks like any of this stuff. You guys name your kids after these people, and none of you do what they, they do. So why is, why is that the case? Uh, and then the Christian, uh, maybe the savvy Christian, retorts and says, oh, no, when, when we did this, you guys went so far off base that, that what you're calling Judaism isn't even recognizable anymore. Now, the downside to that is you try telling an Orthodox Jew who's, you know, who can point back to 613 mitzvot that says, um, I'm doing all of these. How are you telling me that I'm not hearkening back to this at, at a minimum? Um, all right, so good point. Now, I'm not suggesting everybody in here just drop what you're doing and go be Torah observant, and that, you know, that'll, fix, that'll fix all the problems between Judaism and Christianity. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, if your Christianity does, if you don't understand how, what this, how this happened and the fact that you are, you know, we say Judeo-Christian, that, that's an interesting term. The, the Christian, in my opinion, and this won't win you any points with, with any uh, Jewish person that you're talking to, but ought to say, no, I, I am a child of Abraham because I am doing what Abraham and Moses and the prophets asked more than you are. Now, this is a combative way. You wouldn't you know, say it this way, but that that's the idea. And if you can't convince yourself that that's the truth, then you might not be doing it the right way because um, ultimately, remember what the debate was in Acts. The debate in Acts was a specific one. How Jewish do you have to be to be a Christian? And the whole thing with Peter and Cornelius was, was basically, you'll, you'll see Paul develop this theme, but the theme was, um, hey, there's great news. So salvation was from the Jews. Salvation, you know, this is where, this is where um, all God's work is being done. Oh, hey, looks like God's plan was bigger, was, was even bigger than we had foreseen. And now the Gentiles are part of this. And so the debate was, if the Gentiles are part of this, do they come into the kingdom of God through being Jewish? Or has God opened up a Gentile door, basically? Now, the Gentile door was not, is not a terribly new concept. As I pointed out last time, there have always been the righteous among the nations, as the Jews would put it. These are the ones who followed the, the laws of, that were given to Noah, the seven laws that, um, that rabbinical Judaism considers were given to Noah, and that is a long-running tradition. So it's, uh, salvation has been present outside of, out, of, uh, out of Judaism, but not for Jews. So if you're a Jew and you're like, well, I'm going to go the Gentile way, I'll just obey those seven, oh, that's not how it works. You have a specific commandment, was, is the way it has been perceived. In the past, the question was, "What are we going to do with all these Gentiles who are now starting to believe stuff?" I have heard a case made. I don't know; <coughs> it's completely convincingly, but I've heard a case made that said this. If you'll remember, if you look back in Acts, and I, um, if anybody wants to look it up, uh, feel free, and we can read it. Um, it. When the debate is going on of, "Hey, the Gentiles are being brought in now. What should we tell them to do?" And there's this council at Jerusalem is trying to figure out what to do. And James, who really emerges in many ways as, as at least uh, the head of the council speaking of the church, if Peter is the, the foremost apostle, uh, first among equals in the Catholic view and the, and the Orthodox view, <coughs> the Protestants are like, I don't even know what that means and I want to talk about it because I'm just going to get in trouble. Um, it, if James says something very interesting, he says, command them to stay away from meat sacrificed to idols and from you know, meat that has the blood in it and, and sexual immorality. And he lists a couple of these Noahic kind of laws. And then he says something interesting. He says, for in all of the world or something like this in, the, in their synagogues where the law of Moses is being preached. As, and I heard the case made. He said that because what he's saying is, okay, the Gentiles can, can start with those, but eventually they'll hear these laws being preached, the law of Moses being preached, and they will follow that. And you'll see when Paul comes back in, and Paul, we tend to think of Paul as like, Paul is like, nope, that, the Jewish stuff is gone, Gentiles have got their own path, this is what we do, this is what you guys do. Uh, and by the way, all Christians live in that kind of freedom. When he comes back to Jerusalem, does anybody remember what James tells him? This is obscure, most people don't pay too much attention to this. J James says... Who follow Moses and they hear that you're going to be Yeah, the James is like words on the street that you've turned your back on Judaism and you think Judaism is no good. Not Judaism. That the practice now. Now see, I'm doing it automatically, wrongly. 
uh, let me correct myself, that you're saying the law of Moses is of no value and we shouldn't be doing that anymore. Clearly you don't believe that, Paul. That would be silly, wouldn't it? In order to show them that that's not what you believe, go and he, he, you have to go back into the Old Testament and see what he's talking about. But he tells them to take part in, in sponsoring and helping these young men fulfill this vow, which they do is a formal process, and they shave their heads and all the stuff at the end of it. And Paul does it. Paul doesn't turn around and be like, no, James, you've got it wrong. You're missing out. Paul goes along with it. The person who was making this point was basically trying to make the, uh, making a couple. I've heard two points made. One was Jewish believers should be Torah observant. They, the freedom they enjoy is the same freedom the Gentile does, which is like we're supposed to be free in Christ because grace will cover it all. But I'm free doesn't mean like, well, I, I'm free and I don't like that guy, so I'm going to murder him. And that's okay. The, the grace of, of Christ will, will work. It, but the same way that we would say <coughs> no, no Christian who, who has the Holy Spirit would, would do that, they're making the point of no Jew, will stop observing the law of Moses because this was the commandment to the Jews at the time. Now, I bring this up not because I think that you should go into a deep analysis necessarily of like, all right, fine, am I supposed to start um, living live according to the Torah? I don't. You, see, you can see that I don't just by looking at me. Um, but... I would point out that, that if this is your world right here, you are forgetting the firstborn, who are the Jews. Now, to your point about the Gentile, uh, and the quick counterpoint, looking into rabbinical Judaism, looking into Judaism, you have the same three circles. Actually, you have three kind of grades of circles. And three is, is conservative at estimate. Like, there are dozens and dozens of versions of Judaism, ranging from kind of ultra extreme orthodox all the way through, you know, I, I, I wouldn't even call it reform because it's so loosey-goosey to call it reform. The reform guys would get, would get bent, out of, out of you, bent out of shape at you. And you, occasionally, if you see this, you'll see Jew on Jew violence where this guy here was not uh, doing enough or the state of Israel was not doing enough for these guys and they're, they're bringing... If you never deviate from this and, and this right here, you can make a strong case for until we, the, the nation of Israel, stop doing all of the things we're doing. Stop believing. Remember what a secular government is to a, to a um, Orthodox Jew. Uh, it is exactly what got Israel into the difficulty in the first place. It is the kings who did not listen. You know, you, and when you read Kings and Chronicles and Samuel, do you remember the differentiator between the good kings and the bad kings? Because it's, it's almost a litany. It's, and he followed the commandments of the Lord with all of his heart, like his father David before him, neither turning to the left nor turning to the right, or something like that, in that kind of formula. Those were the good kings. And what they meant by that was, remember what David did. David was like, we're doing stuff just like the, the, um, like the law of Moses says. And when the wrong guys pick up the ark, and Uzziah reaches up and touches it, boom, dead. David isn't, doesn't get upset at God about that. He's like, we messed this up because we didn't do it right. We need to get back and pay attention to it. And, and that was his attitude the whole time. The, the evil kings were the ones that said, and they did not keep the commandments of the Lord, but they um, fill in the blank with, put, high, you know, put altars in the high places, sacrifice to Baal, put Asherah poles in there. You, you, uh, if you read very closely, some of those uh, verses in there, you'll see that at times they brought idols, Baal and Asherah and all that stuff, into the actual temple. And when the good kings came in place, it talks about them pulling those things out of the temple. So the temple, uh, Solomon's temple, had idols in it for a while. So this is part of the, um, the in and outs of how this goes. And these guys, the, the Orthodox today, are saying, or maybe the more extreme versions of Orthodox are saying, until we get the temple rebuilt, we are living apart from the will of God. And they're trying everything they can do to get that temple rebuilt. Minor problem, <laughs> there's, a, there's a mosque on top of it right now. So you can see that that's kind of teed up for, for difficulty. Okay, and then don't forget that, that Islam, you know, if you've got, um, we'll say Abraham here, they, they're called the great three Islamic, uh, Abrahamic faiths of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And when you actually go and you read the Torah and you read, uh, the, uh, when you read the Hadith and you read the uh, Quran, mo more in the Hadith, 
when you read the strong hadith, the ones that are accepted broadly among uh, Muslims, the amount of influence that is uh, Jewish is absolutely non-trivial to the point where there are hadith of Jews in Mecca and Medina interacting with Muhammad and they are saying, and Muhammad is saying, you're people of the book and he judges people by the book. So a guy's caught in adultery uh, and the, the story goes that he, you know, the guy, uh, Muhammad's like, break, break out your law and read it because we'll judge you according to your law. And he covers up the <laughs> death penalty part of it with his thumb as he reads. And Muhammad's like, what's under your thumb? And he pulls it off and he's like, all right, that's your law. Here you go. And it was not just your law, but that, that is the law. You'll notice that that is the same penalty in Islam. So uh, keep in mind that all three of these, I, I do get a little bit out of shape when people say the, um, the Muslim God is not the same as the Christian God, is not the same as the Jewish God. If you're going to be so exacting, you have to be careful because they're at least saying this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And if you're going to say, well, that concept is not the same because here are the properties of the Islamic God that are not the properties of the Christian God. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm up for you doing that. Just make sure that if you're going to DQ somebody else for not having, you know, how many properties does God have? Let's pretend that he has 50 properties. How many of the 50, no, 10, how many of the 10 properties of God do you have right? How many of them are you mistaken on? And I'm not making some universalist inclusivist argument. I'm just saying be, be a little cautious before you point your finger and be like, those guys are outside the circle. This kind of thinking leads me to believe that um, I wonder, I don't know this, if, you, if I look at Mormonism as a whole, I can point out to you right off the bat, here are 10 things that are fundamentally and deeply wrong with Mormonism. Okay? So I'm not going to turn around and say Mormonism is a, uh, a, a correct view of, of Jesus and Christianity and God at all. You know, especially the, as God, there, there are major philosophical problems with it. If God was like man beforehand, then you've still got an infinite regress of gods. Who is the original one? And if the Mormons don't know who the original one is, then they've got a uh, philosophical problem that can't be solved, which is an infinite regress in time, which doesn't let you ever, ever get to now. If you know who, who the first one is, well, that's actually who God is, and what are you, what are you messing around with all this inter intermediate stuff for? Um, but I will say this, I wonder if there are not believers, true believers, among the Mormons, who, <coughs> if you ask a lot of the Mormon laity, tell me who Jesus is. He's the Son of God, and wh what is his role? He's the Savior of mankind, he died for us on the cross, and it's by his sin that we are saved, and, and you, they will give an articulation that would make a Baptist proud. Is that what that guy believes? And if you're like, well, what about uh, Jesus and Satan being brothers? And he's like, I, I've never heard that. Okay, well, is that guy even a Mormon? You see my point? So just be, before you're ready to point at someone and put the, the scarlet M on their chest or the scarlet whatever the other religion is, talk to them, know them, figure out what it is they actually believe before you go um, give them a hard time about it. That answered one-tenth of your question, not the key one that you're looking at, but to, to your initial point of, as a Gentile, this is confusing. Should we reunite? Y yeah, absolutely. <coughs> and the way to reunite, in my mind, is this. This is going to make the Protestant uncomfortable, but let me make you uncomfortable. When Jesus talks about who's living in the kingdom, who's doing the will of the Father, how does he characterize it? What does he say? Say again. Those who obey my commands. That sounds awfully works based, doesn't it? But that's what Jesus says every time. Now he does at one point, and this is the Protestant saving grace. Is to, and by the way, I'm Protestant, so it's not like the Protestant uh, argument is like no. One time in John, he says, and the work of the uh, Father is to believe in the one in whom He is sent. Okay, yeah, great. We're off the hook. We just have to believe in Jesus. Do you know who else believes that Jesus is the Savior of mankind and the Son of God? The devil? Okay, so then that's not going to get you a lot of credit. It'll keep you just to the right of the devil, uh, or the left of the devil, or above the devil, whatever. Uh, not the comparative place you want to be. So if that's possibly true, then consider the following. Um, let your work in the kingdom of heaven be the leadership and the uniting factor that you desire to have. And I, I put it this way, and I'll quote um, a, not a uh, uh, not canonized saint, uh, but this is Colin Powell, St. <laughs> Powell, uh, whose leadership in the army was widely recognized. 
And like his number one leadership quote, like when you distilled what he did down, he says, uh, and I'm quoting here, the one thing that I've learned, Powell's saying this, is that soldiers watch what their leaders do. You can give them classes, you can lecture them forever, but it's your own personal example that they will follow. Now what I say to you is, um, if you want to lead Christians in that vein, and you want to collaborate with Catholic believers, and you say, I've got an idea, let's, let's work for the kingdom, but we've got to get some stuff straight first. You, we can't just be disagreeing about this Eucharist stuff. You know? We can't be disagreeing about, you know, fill in the blank, whatever your, your thing is that you don't like about the Catholic Church. If your first step is, Jesus asked us to take care of you know, the poor, the sick, the, the sinners, the, those outcasts from society, etc., <coughs> let's go do that together. In the course of doing that, you'll probably end up having conversations about doctrine, and you'll probably end up sifting them out into these are important and these are not. That sieve of doing the work of the kingdom is the best filter you can have for what is important and what ought to be a priority out there, because you'll run into it in the real world of doing kingdom work. Now, I'm not just saying the work of the kingdom is go help the poor. That's clearly a part of it. You know, the, uh, the poor, the, the naked, the sick, those in prison, that this kind of stuff is stuff that Jesus keeps citing. And I wonder at times, far be it from me to be able to plumb the mind of God, but I wonder at times if this is not part of the reason that he focuses on that so much. When you stop saying what, I'm gonna, what I know is important and what I know <coughs> is, matters more than anything else, when you start saying, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do that which nobody has any good motive to do. Right? You want to get ahead in this world, what's the best thing you can do? Take your treasure and give it to somebody that doesn't have anything? That doesn't help you, does it? That doesn't help you personally. Maybe it makes you feel better at best, but, but it, doesn't, it doesn't advance your cause that much. So going and helping out the people who can't help you back is a good sign that you're willing to put that that kind of thinking behind you, and let me explain why I think that thinking, and then I'll get to their, uh, why that thinking is important. What was the problem in the Garden of Eden? What was the problem in the Garden of Eden? What caused the fall, you might say? What was the human reason for causing the fall? What was the human thinking on it? Pride. Maybe <coughs> partly pride, for sure. Wanting what? I want to do it my way. What was the tree of what? Knowledge of good and evil. So the problem with knowledge as an end in itself is, and we do this all the time, right? Who are, our, who are the highly honored people in our society? PhDs, highly educated people. If you've been to the Middle East, you'll know that uh, in some countries in Southwest Asia, there are only, you only run into two people, engineers and doctors. This is engineer Majid. This is doctor, you know, whoever. Everybody wants to be an engineer and doctor because that is a position of honor. It's a title of honor. It's an honorific, et cetera. Um, even on the, on the um, religious side, it's something like that. Here's a doctor of the church. Or in Islam, it's, here's a, they have specific titles for people who have been to the Hajj. And that, so you'll, uh, you'll hear people called Haji whoever. That means this was a guy who went and did one of the five pillars. And you'll have other guys like Hafiz, guys who who's, have memorized the Quran. And they, they have two different titles. One of them is people who have memorized the Quran. And other ones who have memorized it and can sing it in a particularly good way, and they get their own title. But these are, we honor knowledge an awful lot. Is knowledge what we ought to honor? Now, all you gotta do is look at, pick, pick whatever university you don't like, and look at some of the highly educated people on there you don't like that you think are silly, and you'll know the difference. The difference there is, for all the knowledge that that guy or gal has, they don't have two common sense brain cells to rub together because, fill in the blank with whatever your justification is there, right? You can't say that about people who do good works for people that can't pay them back. Like there's just something that's inexplicably, undeniably good about that. And this is why I think, uh, I, I wonder if God hasn't said, if, I, if you want to know whether you're somebody who trusts the Lord, leave the, th we're in solid ground. So when I say this, consider what I'm doing here. Leave the thinking to God, leave the knowledge to God, you do the doing. Now, obviously, I'm big into pursuing knowledge. We wouldn't have this class. I wouldn't do the things that I do. But if you do that to the exclusion of the commands that Christ gave you, you're not 
making him your Lord. You are making some false god of knowledge your, your Lord. Now, our, our God does know all things, but he doesn't tell us all things. And there's a reason for that. It's the same reason you don't tell your kids all things. All right, you roll that stuff out when they're ready for it. If you want to be ready for it, you do the same thing you wait for your kids to do. When you prove yourself responsible with what I've given you, then I'll give you more. Right? That's not rocket science, and yet we pretend like it doesn't work that way with God, or we pretend that like, that's not a good thing. If it's not a good thing, stop doing it to your kids. If it is a good thing, then recognize that's your relationship to God. Jesus said, unless you become like one of these little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what I think he's talking about. Now, since it took me 15 minutes to answer one question, what other questions do you have? <coughs> sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, Derek. Oh, that's fine. Um, no, I hear what you're saying about the, the works, but I think there, I mean, wouldn't you say there needs to be that underlying motivation to be able to unite? Because I think, you know, you look at Catholicism, I mean, they, they outright reject the gospel. I mean, they... Wrong. Hold they on. Right. Wrong. Stand by for, for fight. Hold on. Let, let's hear. <laughs> this, is, this will be good because it will help us understand uh, what, the, what the picture is that you have. But go ahead. So when, when you say the Catholic well, well, rejects the gospel, not, what do you yeah. It's just getting back to who Jesus is and, and the way to salvation. And I think that, you know, really uniting the church and saying, you know, who Jesus is, the way to salvation, I think will take care of the works part. I got you. But let me yeah. add um, back to the cat. So um, uh, I, I will agree with your larger point. Let me pick on a smaller point. When you say the Catholic does not believe the gospel, what? Do, tell me exactly what you mean by that. Well, I look at, you know, <laughs> what's, the, the re, what's the reason for going and confessing your sins to a priest? You know, the, the middleman's been established in Jesus. You know, why is that? Okay. Now, what if the Catholic says to you, uh, I'm following the commands of Jesus? That's why I go to confess to a priest. Then what would you say to him? Mm-hmm. Well, I'd say, I mean, but I, I don't see why uh, another man. With you would need to confess your sins to another man when you have Jesus. And the Catholic might say to you, well, the reason that you confess your sins to another man is that God told us to confess our sins to other men. Now, if the Catholic said that, then you might retort, show me where you mean by that. And then the Catholic will say, the, 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 now, not these Catholics, right? If you're talking to these, they're going to be like, I don't know. I go to Mass once in a while, right? But let's say you're talking to one of these. They will, they will hopefully say to you, they'll be educated enough in their own faith to say to you something like, Come, let me show you this verse that says, can confess your sins one to another. And let me show you another verse that talks about iron sharpening iron. Let me show you another verse that yeah, says, no, you know. I, I did that. And but so. But don't they, they, they still take that as a substitute to, oh, well, I don't need to pray to Jesus to the forgiveness of my sins. I've already confessed it to another person. Well, then right? the, the, another hopefully the savvy Catholic will tell you something. Yeah. Hopefully the savvy. Yeah. Hopefully the savvy Catholic will tell you. No, it's not. Well, um, it, this is my point. It might be correct for some of them out here. It's not Catholic doctrine. What the Catholic doctrine will do is they might tell you something like this. If it were the case that you were not supposed to pray to Jesus, uh, to God, in the name of Jesus, for the uh, forgiveness of your sins, then why, when you confess to me that you, you know, were angry with your brother and you punched him in the head, uh, did I say to you, um, you know, you've confessed sins and I've said, and by the way, the Catholic priest does not say, I forgive you for your sins. The Catholic priest says, your sins are forgiven, because he's saying, I'm assuring you, it is reassurance that your sins are forgiven. And then he'll say, and for penance, I want you to say, 10 out, you know, whatever. But at some point, he's going to give you our paters, our fathers. And then he says, why would I give you a prayer that says, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, as part of your penance, if it was not to drive home to you, that, this is, that your forgiveness comes from God and that you must confess to him for it, and because you're doing it in this prayer here. This is not just something you're saying. So this is my point is one of the things that will help us in all of this is, by the way, you can easily be forgiven and should be forgiven for believing that that's what Catholics think because there's a lot of these Catholics that will tell you that. That's how it works. You can also be forgiven, you should be forgiven, for thinking that Protestants are fill in the blank with whatever your favorite, you know, which, um, the Protestants are so, um, are so heretical that they've given up on obeying God at all. That they just say, I can do anything that I want. I can literally murder people, and God's fine with that. 
that you can be forgiven that because that's preached from pulpits in Protestant churches, right? And you can be forgiven for thinking this Orthodox, you know, we don't see Orthodox much around here. They're, they're hard to find. <laughs> they're very small communities and they are fairly tight unless you're poor and then you'll see them all the time because they're running around giving food to the poor. Uh, but at the end of the day, a lot of what we know about these different faiths comes from these areas where the uneducated <coughs> and the ill-adapted to their faith are representing the faith, faith more vocally than the others. Yeah, I guess that the, just the problem is that, that the larger portion are those people. But that's true in Protestantism, too. Well, um. well let me ask you this. Uh, not Forget Reston Bible Church, because you're here at Reston Bible Church. Right. All these guys are good, right? Oh, yeah, Nobody's off. Right. Absolutely, you're right. If, if, you say, if you take Protestantism as a group, forget RBC, and it includes your Baptist, and, and let me get, let me get. Westboro Baptist. Your Westboro Baptist, your Episcopalians, mm -hmm. your Presbyterian Church of the U.S. Um, fill in all, uh, Joel Osteen and uh, all these, put all of those in there and now label that Protestant. And you're a Catholic and you're looking at that and you're like, that is a circus. And the one thing I know about Jesus is that he's not a ringmaster or, a, or the chief clown. So there's no way those guys have got it right. If you're a Catholic, you can take a little bit of comfort in, in the funny hats and the fancy robes because you're like, at least we're not doing that. You know what I mean? So uh, we tend to think of Protestantism like, no, this is Protestantism. Look right here. Uh, the Catholic is going to say the same thing. No, no, no. You're, not, you're talking about some clowns over there, not the real ones. Say, uh, what in, in your terminology are you calling a Catholic? Ask the guy next to you. <laughs> a Roman Catholic? Well, what do you call a, a Episcopalian, an Anglican? What are you calling a Catholic? Uh, so now you ask, a, uh, this is a great question. So now what do we mean when we say and use this label? One of the reasons I don't like to, when someone asks you, ask me, what do you, uh, you know, what is your religion? I even try to stay away from saying I'm a Christian. Because that wasn't actually the term that people used. I was a follower of the way, is, is the way they talked about it. Now, the context they were talking about was in Judaism, so it's not, it's not really useful to do that, because people would understand that better back then. <coughs> but at the end of the day, I'll say, I'll say something like this. I'm, um, I'm a servant of God. Now, they're like, oh, you're a servant of God. That could mean anything, <laughs> right? Now, what do they have to do? What does a person have to do? They gotta ask more questions and they gotta be willing to listen to what you're having to say because now they're like, I'm in the exercise of classifying you. And I'll be honest with when that kind of stuff happens, I don't look to help them out on getting them down to a particular pigeonhole really quickly. What I'm looking to do is turn around and say, uh, so, you're, so you're Protestant. Well, no, I wouldn't call myself Protestant because, and I'll list out some Orthodox stuff. Oh, you're Orthodox. Well, I don't know if I'd say that because, and I'll list out some Catholic stuff. Well, are you, what, you know, what about Muslims and what about the Middle East and what about, and by the time they're done talking to me, I'm hoping that they come to the conclusion of this guy lives somewhere in this central area and it's hard for me to tell exactly what he is because I'm hoping the conclusion is this is a guy who is, whose job is to advance the kingdom of God. And if you don't understand what the kingdom of God is, you're not going to get what advancing the kingdom of God is. And so one thing I would say to us in this room is this, Jesus came not to proclaim Christianity. He didn't even come to proclaim Judaism. He came to proclaim the instantiation of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is very simple. It's where God is the boss and the rest of us follow his orders. Like the Garden of Eden should have been in the first place, right? And God was not giving orders like clean this place up and make sure that these things are, in, you know, he put him in, man in as a gardener. What was the purpose of the garden? So that God could eat the best fruit? For all we know, God didn't need anything in the garden in his anthropomorphic form. You know, this was all for us. It was literally like, I just want you to make your own food. And by the way, apparently it's not that hard. It grows everywhere. <laughs> so the, God is <coughs> interested in us, and the kingdom is about building God's kingdom on earth. When people ask, what is heaven? If your answer is, it's when you're in the presence of God, what's the problem with your answer? God is omnipresent, according to your view, if you're an orthodox believer, or a little old orthodox in here, which means we're in the presence of God now. So is this heaven? Well, uh, well, what I mean was exclusively in the presence of God. Oh, does he kick the angels out? Is that how it works? It's just one-on-one? -on -one? What about the other believers? Okay, well, not that. It's, um, well, not clouds and a throne. It's, uh, 
and all of a sudden we go into, into vapor lock, right, where you can't explain it. The kingdom of God is simply the utopia that exists. When the king, the greatest king of all time, whose only interest is in loving you and having you love each other and be as happy as you possibly can be, and he happens to know that you loving him and you loving everybody else is the best way to do it, then the law of, what would we call the law that only says love everybody else and love God to the most you can? What would you call that law? The law of love. What does Paul talk about? The law of love. This is, this is what Christianity is. It is living in utopia. If your church is not utopia or so much closer to utopia than the rest of the world is, you are doing it wrong. Your church is not in the kingdom. People should walk into the church and say, now I understand what you mean by the kingdom of God, and now I understand what heaven might eventually look like. Now, we are in, we're in, in occupied territory as a Christian, right? You're a foreigner. You're a sojourner. You're a traveler who's moving from one place, like Abraham. This is all calling back to Abraham, right? Leave where you are. Go to a place that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. This promise is the same. There's no change. That's what heaven is. And God's, remember that the Christian and the Jew who believe in the resurrection, believe in a resurrection to what? Where do you live after the resurrection? Where do you live after the resurrection? New heaven on the new earth, right? You are still going to be instantiated physically in some sort of body like we are now. That's what heaven is, or at least step one, as far as we can tell, right? That all that has been revealed. That is very important to, rec to recognize because it means <coughs> if you can't do it in this body form, you can't do it in the next one. Now, I'm not saying, all right, fine, if your church doesn't get heaven exactly right and you're not living, like, if you're not living flawlessly and there's nothing but love, there are no tears, none of that stuff, then you're not a Christian. That's not what I'm saying. It, clearly, this is a learning process for us. But Paul describes that as well. This is sanctification. This is us growing by the same way that kids grow. And that ultimately, I think what God will do after the resurrection is he will take away the temptations to the bad desires for us, and basically you're back in the garden where all of the temptations... So imagine now that God drops you back in the garden. Same, same rules. Same rules. And what he says instead is, here's the tree of life. Here are all the other trees. Here's the tree, no longer the knowledge of good and evil, because you have that one. Here's the tree of self-governance. If you want to run the earth yourself, you can. Just go eat from this tree. That's it. The tree of self-governance. Self-governance, that's got to be a good thing. If you, you though, have been through this, yeah, you see it. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is the tree that says, I'm going to make the decisions. I'm not going to leave it up to God. Right. Now, if you would be back in the garden at that point and be like, this is uh, absolutely not. The one thing I know never to do is to eat from that tree because I have come to trust the Lord that no matter what he asks me to do, it will be for my good. So if what he says is, what he says to you is, I want you to go do this stuff in the garden, and you're like, man, I don't really feel like doing that. But you know the Lord, you'll know he's only asking me to do that because it's going to be awesome. Right? That, that's the God that we should know and love. And so you wouldn't have to, some, you might say to yourself, all right, fine, if he's going to do that, let's, let's put a vault around that thing, and let's lock it up so nobody will ever get to it. Nobody will be in heaven who would ever go within 100 feet of that tree, right? You just wouldn't do it because you know. You've tried it. You've tasted it, and you know it doesn't work. And so you now you trust God, which is all he was asking us to do in the first place. All he asked us to do was to trust him. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was simply, a, if you don't trust me, then yes, you can do it yourself. Just to let you know, on the day that you eat of it, you will, you will die. So I'm, just, I'm not tricking you into this. I'm letting you know how bad it'll be. You will die. <laughs> That's bad. But up to you, if you want to. I'm like, eh, let's give it a shot. We won't do that anymore. Okay. I saw other hands. I forgot. <coughs> to the, uh, what I would encourage us to do. Um, spend time neither looking for the commonalities nor the differences. Spend time instead doing the work of Christ and see who follows you. So old Marine combat story, 
end up under fire, and a guy, uh, um, the guy that was leading this engagement, these guys ended up like exposed. Uh, so, you know, a couple guys with guns have basically this whole squad trapped in the open. And they're ducking down behind his wall and popping up behind, behind the wall. And the lead of this squad realizes what's going on. And if, you're, if you know anything about the military, if you're stuck in the open with nothing to hide behind, that's considered a bad position to be in. <laughs> right? The only thing you can do is lay down and make yourself as small a target as you can be and lay fire back in the other direction. This guy sees the writing on the wall. And so he immediately closes the distance while these guys are ducked behind. Why? Because up here you can do something about it. Back here you're just a sitting duck. And he realizes that, yeah, standing up you might be a bigger target, but at the end of the day, you, uh, that, that's the best thing to do. He gets up to the top. He actually puts a couple grenades over the top. Uh, and these guys are, are now, the bad guys, are, bad guys, the guys that are fighting him are no longer shooting back at him. Maybe they're dead, maybe they're not. And he turns around to look at the rest of his squad. And what did he see when he turns around and looks at the squad? He sees two things. 90% of the squad is still laying there. 100 yards back, and two members of the squad had followed him and were now ready to finish clearing it. Those three saved the lives of these other ones. If you want to know who your most valuable soldier is, that's a reasonably good test. Now, that's not it. There are other, you know, there are other justifications why other guys may have been doing it, but that's a decent filter for at least the folks who are going to be cool under combat, brave in combat, Figure out the right thing to do, do it, and support their buddies because war is a team sport. It's not an individual sport. So in the same way, and I, I always use the, mar the martial comparisons because I think people at least understand them, um, and I do, uh, or think I understand them. When you do that, you end up saying, now I know who I can depend on, and now I know who's, who I can move with. So consider Peter. Uh, excuse me, Paul, and you remember he goes out on a missionary journey and one of the guys kind of quits halfway <laughs> and then his next argument with Barnabas that caused him to go in separate directions is, I'm not taking that guy with me. In, in this term that I just said is, when he was under fire, he didn't help. He just sat there. You know, he didn't follow through. That was probably Paul's um, take on it. Now, obviously, Barnabas had a different idea and maybe Barnabas would get made good use of, of that person as well. But my point is this, um, go and do the work of the kingdom and build your church out of the people who are also doing the work of the kingdom. It at least will start you in a better direction than if you just walk in off the street to a random church and you're like, that preacher sounds pretty good and I like the music, right? <laughs> those, those are not, if you choose your armed forces unit, if you got to choose your unit in the armed forces by Hey, I like the way that they, they sound when they're marching, and those, they got good uniforms. Is that really who you wanted to join? Is, is that the best selection criteria? Everybody picks the Marines because their uniforms are nice. I was a Marine, so yeah. There's a, it's hard. It, uh, there are no ugly men in those dress uh, deltas, that's for sure. It's a good thing. Now, some of us tried really hard, and the, the uniform definitely works. Um, so I get, your, I get your point about sort of <coughs> merger through dif diffusion over time. But the trouble with that is, you know, we were given discernment or the, uh, you know, pattern recognition brains for a reason. Yes. As a, you know, a, a, the defense mechanism of bad policy or yeah. heresy. Mm -hmm. And as a time we are living in now, where there is a lot of heresy in all of these parts, of, in probably all the parts of, of Christianity. Yes. You know. <laughs> it's really hard to exclude if you don't put labels on things and build walls and do that. But then it also, you're cutting off pieces that might be good. Yes. Right? Like a, like a surgeon or something. Yes. And I just don't see, like, I don't see, without, you know, without God's intervention, I don't see any way that there's merger or even just not, just keep splitting and splitting and splitting. I mean, you know. Yes. So I, I don't, uh, so now let me take the point back in the opposite direction because I've probably got as far as in this direction as I'm comfortable. Let me swing back a little bit. 
this is a solid ground. Like this is the critical thinking class, hopefully, of Rest and Bible Church. So the one thing I'm not advocating is, fine, just check your brains, put them in your pocket. Because at the end of the day, when you know, I skipped right over it. But if what I said was, look, we just need to trust God and, and do it. All of this debate is about what did God say to do? So what does it mean to trust God and just do what he said? What did God say to do? And all, hopefully, all the disagreement in these, this, this area is, okay, what exactly is that? So the, the good Christians, the good Jews should be saying, and the good everything should be saying, what did God say to do? Because I want to know because I want to do it. That. That's what I want to do. Okay, Justin's right. Good point. And if we don't have pattern recognition, if we don't think critically, then we're just going to go be Mormons or be Jehovah's Witnesses or be whatever else it is. Yes, right. So um, my, my, uh, my initial counterpoint to that uh, uh, advice, which I have given as myself as well, right? Uh, you're not saying anything I haven't said, <laughs> I think, in the past, would be this. Um, two groups of guys, you know, some of us get our heads together and let's chop through this doctrine, let's figure out what's important. Let's screen out the heresies. Let's make, and let's let's drive forward. In fact, I will I will even go back to the councils, one of, you know, pick some other council other than the first in Nicaea or the third in Nicaea. You know, here's one of these other ones. We're we're settling this stuff. And I don't know if does, does everybody does everybody know about uh, Saint Nicholas, like the Saint Nicholas, the one that Santa Claus is named after. You know the story. He, he's at one of these. He's at one of these meetings, and uh, he gets so mad at an Aryan. <laughs> in the meeting that he punches him. <laughs> like he calls off and hits him. And they throw him in jail. They throw him in jail, and then the, the story comes up of how uh, he was kind of miraculously visited, and, and it seems a little questionable. But then the day, he, uh, he punched somebody. And some of my favorite memes are these Orthodox icons. It's got St. Nicholas on there. It says, I'm here, I'm here to give gifts to children and then punch heretics, and I'm all out of gifts. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all recognize that an ecumenical council that descends into a fist fight is missing something key about being in the kingdom of heaven, right? <laughs> like, but, but I don't know what it is, but it's not that. Uh, so I, uh, I'm caricaturing here, obviously, a little bit. But let's take, and I'm not anti-Saint Nicholas, right? Uh, he did many great things, and you should, you should do those things, too. If mo- and I'm, pick over, I'm over-dependent on Mother Teresa here. But uh, I pick it because we modern people at least look at her and be like, that, she's got something right. You know, the, the council gets together, Mother Teresa get together, and they're arguing of, like, what should we do? And the council's like, look, we've been through this now. We, you know, at the end of all these years, we can tell you very specifically, this is the Latin term that should be used in talking about the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father. We got it. And Mother Teresa's like, yeah, I just helped uh, 1,700 dying Indians. You know, uh, 200 of them came to know Christ because I held them in my arms as they died. What, what did you guys do again? You know, and that, that's kind of the smarmy, quick answer to it. Now, there should be good of good doctrine being judged and promulgated. But if, if, the peop- if Christianity turned around and said, <coughs> hey, I've seen these, these righteous men and women. Let's get them together into a council and then let them decide on it. If that's the way that it was done, rather than these people are the bishops, let's send the bishop off, let's have this power struggle league kind of thing. If it emerged organically because people were like, hey, we've been... We've been doing the good work of the kingdom, but this problem popped up. How are we going to deal with it? And when you look at the early church, that's exactly what happened, right? We're doing the work of the kingdom. Hey, the widows over here from among the Gentile, the Greek believers, are saying the, the boys that are distributed in chow aren't giving as much to them as to the others. Like, this, this emerged. That, that, by the way, wasn't just a, they're being mean to us about the food. That, was a, that could have been a genuine question in early Christianity of like, Aren't we supposed to provide first for the, the Jewish believer and then from there out to these other ones? Um, and then the, the, count, the righteous men were, hey, let's put a council together. Let's figure out what we're supposed to do here. All right, because of this, we'll put this structure in place. Because of this question, we'll put the structure in place. And all of a sudden, you get deacons, a whole new level of the church whose job is to do some of the, the work of the kingdom. What were the apostles doing? When dedicating themselves to prayer, Prayer. These guys are so busy praying, they can't figure out how many people, you know, how to distribute food, right? How long, how long a task is that? Half a day? You guys can't, no, we're too busy praying and teaching people all the things that Christ said to do. Interesting, you know, do we do that here? I, I don't think so, and myself included. You know, I, I wish we looked a little bit more like that. Maybe we should. Maybe they do. There's some awfully good elders on this board, but that's what these elders should be. Your RBC elders should be, and maybe are, the guys 
who are going to be so good, and I, uh, maybe all of them. I know a couple of them that I won't embarrass them, but I'd hold them up and be like, and, and some that aren't elders. There's some guys out there. I can go walk in and introduce you to one that I guarantee standing out in the, the little um, hallway there at the, at the beginning of the first service. It was like, if you want to know something about Jesus, you should ask that guy because he looks more like Jesus than anybody else I know. Uh, and that's the kind of, that's the, the way I think that the faith ought to, to move forward. And then God will raise up in his time the people that he wants to do the things that he wants them to do. Long answer to a good question. But Justin's not wrong at all. Uh, I advocate for the same things. Where should we use our, our good? Um, it should, in my mind, it should be this. Do the work of the kingdom first, and then let the critical judgments uh, resolve conflicts and difficulties that arise. Don't start by identifying conflicts and difficulties and say, once we get this straightened out, then we can do the work of the kingdom. If you do it in that order, you'll never get to the work of the kingdom. And I think we can all point to churches or portions of the churches, all three of them, who get mired in that kind of stuff and never get to the work of the kingdom because they're sitting here debating on stuff that, yes, absolutely needs to be addressed, but not in that order of priority. And when you get your priorities wrong, everybody here knows things just go sideways. Yeah, I agree. I just feel like you know, there's truth in the church that's going like this and just swaying farther and farther <coughs> away from, uh-huh. you know, it's like, and now they're saying, you know, gay marriage is okay. So I want, um, <coughs> part of me wonders the following. Let's look back at the Old Testament and ask this question, right? How many true believers are in the nation of Israel back in the day, right? So h- how do you know when, when, uh, when everybody goes up to the hill, Elijah goes up to the hill, right? And the people, and he's like, comp- here's the plan, competition, all the, the 450 prophets of Baal versus Elijah. Let's find out. Whose God is the real God? Is it Baal or is it the Lord God? And they're like, good plan. D- a cage match. Let's see it. And they go up and they do the cage match. And prophets of Baal dance around for hours and cut themselves and nothing happens. And Elijah's like, maybe he's in the head. Maybe he's asleep. You should talk louder. Right? He wasn't, but his jokes were not, <laughs> weren't like super dignified. They're, literally, one of them was like, perhaps he's in the head. Um, then... He calls on the Lord, and the Lord sends fire down and burns up you know, everything on the altar, including the stones and all this kind of stuff. And then the nation of Israel does what? They say, the Lord, he is God. Okay, right, under that demonstration of power, you're kind of a knucklehead if you, if you don't say yes. But how long did that last? How long were, were those people, quote, unquote, true believers? What I mean by true believers is what God seems to mean by true believers. It is under the testing of their faith did they fall away. Now, eventually, we get back to Baal again, and Elijah is complaining to the Lord. And what does he say? Or maybe before. I'm the last guy. Nobody in Israel. It's just me. And God says, I've got 3,000 who have never bent the knee to Baal out there. Now, 3,000 out of the nation of Israel is not a lot of dudes and gals. That's just, that's a few. But those are the ones that, under the testing of their faith, were like, I will do the right thing. I will not do the wrong thing. How many, when we say the church, you know, you're right. That by the people, by all three of these circles, this is now it, completely illegible. But if you count all three of those circles together and you say that's the church, yeah, I bet 90% of that. You know, people that will fall away, that will not. You know, when, when Jesus gave the ratios of seeds, it was this many seeds. It wasn't the number of seeds, right? But he listed five different possible fates, and only one of them was a good one. And I'm not saying that, okay, well, the number's 20%. No, no, no farmer, uh, who knows? But at any rate, the point is the way is broad, the gate is narrow, all that kind of stuff. Uh, if that's the case, our real question is, how, okay, fine, how do we ensure that we are doing the, the gateway? How are we all on the path? How are we walking the way of Christ, uh, of the Messiah? Then the, the answer there, to my mind, is he who Jesus said, do the following things, he who does those things, and she who does those things, is the one who's doing that. And we all know that, that when we say, well, the problem is, uh, I, I can see by what they are doing that they are not adhering to the truth of the word. That's really what you mean when you say, you know, Jesus commanded that we should not be sexually immoral, but here's a, sexual immor- a version of sexual immorality that we're chasing uh, and saying it's okay. 
let me take the Catholic's position on this one, the true Catholic's position on this. No, there's a little bit of no true Scotsman fallacy here, but the true Catholic will turn around and say this, Protestants, you guys get divorced and remarried in your church. Church is not infrequently. Catholic church will turn around and basically be like, this, is a real, this was a Catholic marriage. If it's, not a, if it's not a Catholic marriage, it's not a marriage. <laughs> and if it, when it is a Catholic marriage, that's a sacrament of the church. And it is a mortal sin to violate it. And so you don't get to just get divorced. And you don't get to just get remarried. The Catholic church is like, you don't, that's not how it works. You don't under, if you think that's how it works, you don't understand marriage. It's one of the sacraments. You gotta, this is how you will do it. If you're going to be in the church, if you're going to be a Christian, this is what you do. And they'll look at us and say, in the list of things that God says, in the kingdom there will not be, and they go and they list things, homosexuals or sexually immoral tend to be at the end of the list, not necessarily at the beginning. So there's a whole bunch of things that, that seem to be as important. But we, it's a hot button issue for us, right? Oh, if this guy says that gay marriage is okay, then they're wrong. Well, they're, they're wrong. That's not okay. You know what else is also not okay? Getting remarried in a certain way under a certain sort of circumstances, right? It's adultery is what Jesus says. And yet there are Protestant churches out there that proclaim it. Are we as been out of shape about that as we are about the gay marriages? Newsflash. If you know who's not having a crisis about whether uh, gay marriage is permissible? The Catholic Church. That, that is not even touching them. They got, nope, nope, that's not a problem. Right? We know what our answer is on this one. It is touching the, the Protestant church, and it's touching the Protestant church, in my opinion, just like every other deviation from the path does. Nobody jumps right into doing cocaine from not having done anything. Right? People drink a little bit, and then they smoke marijuana, and then they do, you know, there's, there's this path that gets you there. The Protestant church did this when the Protestant church says marriage is not a sacrament. Marriage is not a commandment that we're going to follow as closely as we should. So is gay marriage wrong? Yeah, so is this other marriage, and we didn't, but you wouldn't have been here if you didn't do this first. That, that would be my criticism of the Protestant church in this case. So uh, you'll hear me talk about Protestant and Catholic and Orthodox a lot because I don't, I don't even want to be labeled, honestly, a Protestant, nor would I want to be labeled a Catholic or an Orthodox. I want to be, <laughs> I want to be labeled a Christian. And then eventually someone might say his practices adhere most closely to the Catholic faith or to the whatever else. But I want to be like Mother Teresa or like somebody else, you know, pick, pick your favorite here, uh, um, C.S. Lewis. You know, there's a guy who's like, well, what was C.S. Lewis's denomination? Anything. Yeah, you, you know that, but most people don't know that. Most Protestants don't know that because we don't care. Because nothing that we love about C.S. Lewis, has, who's, who's a prophet of the, Catholic, of the Protestant church, uh, nothing we love about C.S. Lewis is, has to do with his Anglican Nism, right? We love the kingdom part that we see in him, and the same is true of other things. Okay. The one trouble we have with labels anyway is <coughs> change of the time. Yeah. So C.S. Lewis and Anglican is not the same as Anglican today in most places. Yes. But, you know, I think the changing of words and the changing of things, I think, like, there are old things coming back, like Gnostic heresies and things like that, that I think are a part of these kind of other things. It's the things that are, it's not the things like on the outside that are coming in, it's the things that are almost the same as what we have, but that, you know, like you said, that lead you a little bit farther, a little bit farther away. Yeah. Those are the things that I think that are coming in that are the most damaging. So I agree, <coughs> I agree with your opinion, uh, with your permission, let me um, take that in a, a direction that goes backwards in time. I th this is a, has been a very interesting study for me for a couple of reasons. One, the amount of data that we have on it is very, very small. And the, but yet, I think it's important. And because it's small, it's, it's fairly quick. Look at the time from the fall up through the time when, when um, through basically the flood, right? In Genesis, this is a very short section of the book. And key lessons emerge from that. So you might ask yourself this question, is it possible to be a follower of God right after the fall and before uh, you know, the world gets, goes so sideways that God's like, we're, we're wiping this out, we're starting again. But Noah somehow has got it right, right? Noah's a righteous man in, in the earth in his day. So God picks Noah and says, I'm going to save you and your family, and this is how we're going to do it. Why? And he picked him because he was righteous. So apparently there was a way from 
Adam and Eve, through Noah, to be righteous, what was that way? That was the first question. And by the way, somebody did it so well that this is a man. If I could have this on my, you would need a tombstone, right? So, uh, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So we got no data on Enoch other than this guy walked with God. Now, we know that that's what we're supposed to do because that theme gets talked about throughout the whole Bible, to walk with God. We say it all the time. How's your walk, right? Don't we say that, Protestants? We say that all the time. Well, it's not a Catholic saying, maybe, but Protestants want to say, how's your walk with God? What do you mean by that? Well, whatever Enoch was doing, but do we know what that looks like? Go back to the, the first bit of data that we have on what's good and what's bad after the fall. What's the first test, example, of what's good and bad after the fall? Does anybody remember? They hid from God. Yeah, okay, yes, yeah. Uh, sorry, after they kicked out of the garden. Thank you. Yes, this is the son of Adam and Eve. And one of them, it says, and Abel was a shepherd, and Cain was a farmer, and I'm paraphrasing here. And they bring their sacrifices to God, and Abel's was accepted, and Cain's was not. And Cain got all grumpy about it, and God says, be careful, sin is at the door, and if you do not master it, it will overtake you. And... Well, you know the rest of the story. Why was Cain's sacrifice not acceptable? And Abel's was. Some people were like, well, Abel offered a lamb, and Cain offered fruit. That was his heart. Uh, oh, and, okay, maybe, right? So it's an easy one. Not easy. We, we almost feel like we have to go there because we're like, well, rats. I know it's not the lamb thing. <laughs> what, what am I supposed to do? You know, what, what is it? What is it? It's got to be his heart, right? So it is his heart, but is that the first part? Did God just look and be like, ah, I don't like that guy's attitude? Did Cain do something wrong? Now, by the way, is offering a fruit sacrifice, a, a grain sacrifice, is that not correct? It's commanded. Yeah, that's one of the, the kinds of sacrifices that you bring to the temple. So it's not the, it wasn't one was a lamb and one wasn't, because one was a farmer and one was, was not. What was the difference? God said, if you look, you have to look very closely in there, you have to read like you care about it, but when you go in to look at it, you'll look and see that it looks like Abel brought the first of his flock there, and Cain did it at the end, afterwards. Like, his, Abel's first thought was, this, is, this is, belongs to God, I go give to God what is his. Cain was like, I'll get around to it, and he brought it to God eventually. That is the difference. What does that mean for our lives? Now, I'm not saying that that means like, all right, when you get your paycheck, if you go get groceries... <laughs> Before you go to the church, and, or to, to whatever poor that you want, and you do that first, then uh, that's it. You're, next thing you know, you're going to be murdering your brother. Uh, I'm not saying that exactly, but I'm saying that look at, look at what the difference was. Like the, the simplicity, the, this is, should not be complicated. This should not be complicated. What it ought to be is there are these very basic, basic things that God asks us to do. And right now in our modern culture, we scratch our head and we're like, Sabbath and rest and what? I don't, I don't get it. And Jesus later is like, Sabbath wasn't made for man. Uh, well, God, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. So if you're wondering why this, why? Why was the Sabbath made for man? There are a whole bunch of reasons behind that. There's rabbis who've written volumes on that. And at the end of the day, there's good answers out there. But the bottom line is this is not complicated. And I point to Cain and Abel to say, if the commandment that you know from God is honor me, with what I give you, and your, your heart is not, okay, I understand that that came from God, and I need to honor him properly because I love him, right? You imagine your kid, you, those of you that have kids, or you can imagine this if you don't, when you give something to your kid, and your kid just takes it and runs, and he's happy with it, you're like, okay, that's okay. When your kid turns around and grabs it and says, thank you, Dad, thank you very much, this was, I love this, and they play with it, you're like, that's it. I'm done parenting. This is the best kid I've ever seen. That, that's what you want. And that's what God wants. So be the kid. Remember the, the lepers? We're healed. Whew. One guy. Thank you. Weren't there 10 of you guys? Just one, I guess. So it's sim it really is easy. It really is simple. And the reason that I love looking at that section in there is in between Adam and Noah is everything that you need in order to follow the Lord. And it's this long. And then now you can start to understand the rest of the Bible in the light of that tiny little bit of study. You, you know what I mean? That, that, and it explains what we mean by, which is right, that his heart was wrong, but how do we know his heart was wrong? 
What, what, where did his heart go wrong? And the heart went wrong. Now, if you know that, hasn't a verse you've always struggled with been this? Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, newsflash, nobody in this room is poor. So does that mean the kingdom of God doesn't belong to us? Or they're more blessed? Why are the poor blessed? Because the poor know, one possible explanation, I think, makes more sense. The poor know this, their next meal comes from the Lord. And the rich forget this. The rich forget this. Because they say, I've got tons stored up in my grain bins. I'll tear these down and build bigger ones. And the Lord says, you fool. From this night, your, your soul will be required of you. It's another person that didn't get it. Not that he was wrong to build bigger barns, but he's wrong because he didn't get the same thing that took Cain, and Abel, or took, uh, Abel, uh, Cain off the path. You see what I'm saying? This, if you can't link a theme from Genesis all the way through maps that is, uh, that is there all the way across, newsflash, it's not important to your religion. Find what you ought to be doing from the beginning to the end and do those first. Those are the fundamentals. And then we have the discussion on these other things that now God will raise up particular men and women whose judgment and, and discretionary thinking will help guide the rest of the people too. They're shepherds, they're elders. Those are the kinds of people that should be elders. That should be the characteristic. That should be a characteristic of elders. All right, Justin, sorry. What a long answer to a short question. I think your answer was simplicity. <coughs> simplicity, but the right simplicity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's it. Thank you for distilling it to a word. Much better. All right, last questions, last points. We are at, at the end. Um, we've talked about this subject particularly, I think, enough. Um, if I will resend out the list of topics, to, by show of hands, does anybody want? And uh, this is—I wouldn't have put it up there as a topic if we didn't. Want, does anybody want to know this? Do we want to go into the Jehovah's Witness, Mormon stuff next? Is that what people want to do? Raise your hand if you want to do that next. Raise your hand if you want to do something different. Raise your. Hand. <laughs> All right. What's the something different? Anything? I'll send out the list, and don't forget to put your own um, comments back. Uh, what you may want to do. But we'll get to those eventually, and if for some reason there's not an overwhelming majority in the class, I'll take a section of time to say, here are the top, here are the top ten things you, need to, you ought to know about each one of those things. But the, no, the number one on each list will be this. If you're not out Jesusing the Mormon and a Jehovah's Witness, don't bother with the other stuff. Right? Be, be God's, be the person, and remember God's number one command? What's the number one command? What's number two? Love your neighbor as yourself. If you're not doing that first, don't bother doing the rest. And love starts at home. So uh, don't be this gal or guy. Uh, this is heartbreaking to me. Some lady once said, I, this, I can't remember the story. Uh, I wish my husband would treat me just as politely as he does the waiters and waitresses at the restaurant. Right? So if you, who's the first person you should love? Who's the second person you should love? But you cannot truly love the, the poor, the distant, the enemy until you love your friend. It's not like love the enemy because everybody loves their friends. If you're not loving your friends, if you're not loving your husband, if you're not loving your wife, if you're not loving your mother, daughter, sister, uh, brother, if you're not doing that, you will never do this right. You might get this right superficially, but you're never going to get it right truly. This comes first. So find the person who loves you most in your life and be, who, be God to them. And by God, what I mean is provide for them, love them, do for them what, they, what they, you would want them to do for you if you're in the same position. And then start working your way out to your enemies. Don't love your enemies first. Love them after you figure out how to do it right. Then you can go do those other things. And then Mormons. <laughs> and then Jehovah's Witnesses. And then that kind of stuff. Okay. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. Sorry for a little bit more. Uh, I'd saved my voice for so many weeks. I guess I just had to get it all out. Uh, and please, please do, uh, I put this call out on Facebook occasionally. Need more interaction on the topics on Facebook. Okay, so I'll put them out today, and, but submit topics if you don't see your topic in there. Uh, please be active on that one. Thank you, and you all have a great week and a great Memorial Day.